you know, it's obviously directing people around town, and that's raising all sorts of issues, uh, you know, sort of traditional issues. People, when they used to walk around town and trespass and uh, create problems there for other people, property, um, you know, trespass issues, like I mentioned, uh, you mentioned in the intro, criminal type issues, you know, people walking into trouble with the police thinking they've been doing things or people being where they shouldn't be. So there's a whole host of things that come out of this new type of augmented reality gaming. Um, but to me, it's just to the tip of the iceberg on how um, AR is going to affect our daily lives. It's a, it's a medium um, just like the Internet is, and it's going to affect uh, daily life, I think, uh, just as extensively as the Internet has uh, to modern society. And uh, the legal issues that come with them are, are, are going to be exciting. Welcome to the award-winning podcast, Lawyer to Lawyer, with J. Craig Williams and Robert Ambrosi, bringing you the latest legal news and observations with the leading experts in the legal profession. You're listening to Legal Talk Network. Hello and welcome to Lawyer to Lawyer on the Legal Talk Network. I'm Craig Williams coming to you from sunny Southern California. I write a legal blog called May It Please the Court. And this is Bob Ambrogi coming to you from Boston, Massachusetts, where I write a blog called Law Sites. And where I also co-host another Legal Talk Network program called Law Technology Now, along with Monica Bay. Well, Bob, before we introduce today's topic, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Clio. Clio is the world's Leading cloud-based legal practice management software, thousands of lawyers and legal professionals trust Clio to help grow and simplify their practices. You can learn more at Clio.com. That's C-L-I-O dot com. Well, Bob, the Pokemon app developed by Nantic is the latest craze sweeping the world. The location-based augmented reality mobile game app, wow, that's a lot of adjectives, <laughs> produced the 15 million, down, million downloads in just the first week. The game allows players to capture, battle, and train virtual creatures called Pokemon who appear on device screens as though they were in the real world. Well, unfortunately, uh, the app has elicited not only downloads, but already starting to elicit some legal problems. Uh, just today I was reading a story about a Pokemon Go player who said, Cops with their guns drawn mistook him for a robber and searched him at gunpoint. Uh, and that's just uh, one of many issues from trespassing on property, uh, supposed muggings, driving distracted, walking into traffic, falling from cliffs, are just some of the incidents. I guess that's not funny. Fall, are some of the incidents stemming from the use of this app. And in addition, businesses are attracting customers by adding fantasy characters to their stores. So perhaps that raises other questions of liability as well. So today on Lawyer to Lawyer, we're going to look at this uh, latest craze in apps, Pokemon Go, and look at the legal implications surrounding this popular app, including incorporating reality into a fantasy world and whether Pokemon Go is here to stay or simply a flash in the pan. Well, Bob, to do so, we've got two great guests today. Our first guest today is Professor Adam Timish, an assistant professor of law at the University of Nebraska College of Law. Adam focuses his research on the impact of modern technology and markets on existing legal doctrines, with a particular emphasis on tax policy and the regulation of interstate commerce. Welcome to the show, Professor Timish. Thanks, Ed. Happy to be here. And next we have Brian Wassum from the firm Honigman, Miller, Schwartz, and Cohn in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. Brian is the leader of the firm social, mobile, and emerging media industry group and is a litigator with 15 years of experience focusing his practice on intellectual property matters related to copyright, trademark, trade dress, and publicity rights. He also handles many other types of complex commercial litigation cases, including invasion of privacy, defamation, false and deceptive advertising, data security, and product liability issues. Welcome to Lawyer to Lawyer, Brian Wasson. Thanks. It's good to be here. Well, as we start out, Adam, let's start with you and approach the issue of uh, what really Pokemon Go is. I mean, I, I don't play it, and I don't know how many other people that are listening don't play it, but let's assume that they don't and describe what the program is and how people are getting into trouble. 
Um, well, that's a good question. It means a lot of different things to different people, I think. Um, at one level, it's taken this idea of augmented reality and throwing gaming creatures that people have grown up with, and um, you download the app on your phone, and you walk around town and try to track these things. The app uses your GPS and your camera, and you get near one of the digital signatures for these Pokemon characters, and you pull out your phone, and it pops one up on your camera, and you have to uh, flick your thumb and capture it, and then the games are on from there, I guess. So, you know, it's obviously directing people around town, and that's raising all sorts of issues, uh, you know, sort of traditional issues. People, when they used to walk around town and trespass and uh, create problems there for other people, property um you know, trespass issues, like I mentioned in the intro, criminal type issues, you know, people walking into trouble with the police thinking they've been doing things or people being where they shouldn't be. So there's a whole host of things that come out of this new type of augmented reality gaming. Well, the even more important question is, have either of you actually played it yet? Well, I have. Um, at first, just to be able to know what I'm talking about when, when I talk to folks about it, but uh, and also because it's, it is kind of a diverting pastime, at least as much as you know, Candy Crush or any other uh, mobile game that, that folks might play. And, and my kids who are young, they really get into it too. So it actually turns into a, a pretty entertaining family activity. And you haven't walked off any cliffs yet or into the middle of the road or... Not yet, but you know, even even when you're aware of the issues, it's surprisingly easy to bump into something when you're not paying attention. I can imagine. You know, I actually r sort of realized that this was going to be an issue on our end. I uh, woke up on a Sunday morning and I was seeing a bunch of people on Twitter talking about this app, and I thought, ah, my kids might like this. And I downloaded the app, and the first thing we did is follow a Pokemon right into my neighbor's yard across the street. And the light bulb went off over my head, and I said, all right, this is a problem. I'm standing outside my neighbor's window at, you know, 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning. We might want to think about this a little bit. <laughs> I guess what I don't understand about it, I haven't played it, is, is how do the characters get placed where they get placed? Is that something that the app programmers are doing, or is that something that the game players are doing? Um, well, I can address that. The characters themselves are, are pretty much, from what I could tell anyway, randomly generated based on your location. I think they'll be more likely than not to show up in certain places. But there are also these these way stations called Pokey Stops that are fixed locations in geographic space. And uh, there are destinations in the game. You go there to recharge your items, and there are often more Pokey characters in the vicinity of these Pokey Stomps. And, and, and those geographic coordinates have actually been user-generated, but not through this game. Pokemon Go is actually built on the infrastructure of another game that's been out for the past four years called Ingress, uh, published by the same company, Niantic and had people doing pretty much the same thing, going to these places, interacting with the way stations in, in a somewhat different fashion, but same general principle. It was, had a sci-fi theme to it, and it had a very cult following, still does really, within a, a niche group of people. Um, what, what makes that game different from this is that Pokemon is a, is a brand. Uh, it, it's creative content that people recognize. But all, those, all, the, all that data, all that geographic data was already plugged into the software. They just reskinned it with a different copyrighted content and off it went. And what are Pokemon gyms? I understand that those are another feature of the program. So the Pokemon gym is a little different than those Poke Stops. The gym is where um, users will actually go to uh, sort of fight over a location. So the whole point of this, you know, acquiring these Pokemon, other than just getting them, is to do battle with other Pokemon users. And these gyms are places, again, they're geographically sort of set by the program. Um, they're places where users can congregate, and then they sort of digitally battle it out. You choose teams, and you digitally battle your digital Pokemon uh, for control, whatever that means, of these gyms. So sort of from the legal side and thinking about the issues, they're very similar to the Poke Stops. They're places that are set uh, by the developer. They're sort of generally public geographic locations that are set and sort of draw people there to advance in the game. Well, so one of the first legal issues that keeps coming up, I think, is this question of Pokemon Go players wandering onto private property without permission 
So what are the legal issues there and who is responsible if, if there is some wrongdoing there? Uh, if, if players are being led onto property by this game, are there legal implications to that and what's the responsibility? Especially if Niantic is the one placing the Pokemon on someone else's property. Well, that's, yeah, that's what I'm trying to understand. So Adam or Brian, I'll throw that out to whoever wants to take it. But. Sure, I'll take first stab and, and Adam wants to jump in. That's great. Um, it's, it's, the, it's the same issue as anybody wandering around in, in real physical space. And like you said, uh, trespass in real property, you can, you can draw a dividing line between who owns what property and, and who owns the, the neighboring parcel. And if you wander into somebody's parcel without permission, uh, you know, you're, you're liable for trespass. So I think that in the first instance and, and in the main, it's going to be the people actually doing the trespassing who are going to have to worry about any kind of liability. Um, Niantic certainly attempts to insulate itself from liability through its terms of use, um, which uh, would g- give people a heads up to say, hey, you know, you're, you're responsible for where you go, for watching where you're walking, that sort of thing. Uh, and, and those are subject to the same arguments, really, as any other term of use as to whether they're read and agreed to and, and so on and so forth. The interesting issues from a legal perspective, from a lawyer's perspective, are always, well, who, who else can I tag with liability for this? And, and where uh, Niantic or any other game publisher of a, of a similar type of, of AR game system, where they might face liability is, is an interesting and untested question. Uh, and it's really going to have to do in a fact by fact, case by case type of situation and analysis of, of just how much role they had in encouraging people to go there and not giving adequate warnings. Um, but I think it's going to be a pretty uphill battle to tag a, a company with liability here um, for something that somebody ultimately physically chooses to do in, in wandering into somebody else's property. Where does this program fall on the scheme of uh, as an attractive nuisance? It seems to me it certainly would be an attractive nuisance, and the liability that it creates could flow back to uh, Niantic. Why would you not think that? So, so one of the things they've also built into the program that I think is important beyond sort of the terms of use and you know trying to have people assume the risk themselves is they've built an actual distance factor. So anything that appears sort of appears within this 40-meter area And so one of the ways they've designed the program is to say, all right, it might look like that Pikachu or whatever your favorite Pokemon character is. I don't know too many of them, so we'll go Pikachu. Um, You know, it looks like it's on somebody's property, but it's not, right? You can find that anywhere within 40 meters of wherever the digital signature is. So another thing that they've sort of built into the program is that, that you can actually achieve this you know, you don't need to go up to your neighbor's window. So it's just another design aspect. Um, but I think you're right. As far as thinking about it, it, it travels down the line. It looks a lot like what we would think of as an attractive nuisance. You're putting something out there. This is a game that, you know, is aimed largely at kids, although I hesitate to say that as I'm on a college campus and a lot of the college students now, you know, I wouldn't necessarily call them kids, but they grew up in an era. So uh, where they played this and they're playing it on campus a lot. Um, But you have this user base that does involve young kids and some of those arguments for liability, I think get a little bit stronger when you are appealing to kids, you sort of get back into the more classic attractive nuisance case law, you know, the the neighbor's pool, things like that. So I think they do get closer on the spectrum. Um, But as Brian mentioned, with the terms of use, with the fact that the individual user does have, you know, some probably negligence of their own, you know, they're playing a part there, it does seem like it's going to be an an uphill battle to actually get liability back to the developer. One of the news reports I saw about this was, again, I think just today, uh, saying that in Berlin, uh, the Catholic Church has hired a lawyer to tackle a plague of Pokemon Go players invading the Cologne Cathedral, uh, and they have taken legal action to ask uh, the company, uh, Niantic, to exclude the property from the game. Do we know? Is that something that seems to suggest that Niantic has that ability to exclude specific properties? Uh, and it seems like that could uh, raise, again, further liability issues for the company if it uh, doesn't respond to those kinds of requests. Well, I, I hope they don't because the Catholic Church in my neighborhood has four Pokestops in it. It's the best place to recharge. <laughs> um, 
But I, yeah, at some level, I mean, people are going to be making these requests. I'm sure this is only the, the first of many. I'm sure Niantic has a good defense uh, and one that they've probably thought through quite a bit on the fact that this is all user-generated content. So you know, ultimately, they may have some insulation here under you know Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act for just simply hosting this stuff rather than actually um, authoring the content. Um, that remains to be seen if that's available here. And, and it, on, the, on the flip side of it, it's not as if anybody can just choose a Pokestop and, and upload it. There are certain locations that they've chosen based on, on whatever criteria, and uh, those are more or less fixed. You don't see new Pokestops being added. So if they don't allow users to just randomly add them, then um, they may have a role in, in publishing them, and they might want to be more more uh, sensitive to, to these takedown requests. I, I imagine that, especially when uh, requests like this get a sufficient amount of publicity, they're not going to want to court controversy by maintaining those. And in fact, in the ingress game, I know that they have, in fact, reacted to user feedback and removed certain stops. All of this stuff was, is based on, on user input, so they can't verify it. And when, for example, they put uh, a stop point in the ingress game in front of a uh, hospital's ER driveway, a place where you couldn't, you physically could not access it without putting yourself in danger. Um, they changed it and they moved that spot based on user feedback. So if there's enough of a complaint, I think they'll take action. And what happens when individuals get taken advantage of through this game? Obviously, there are some businesses that are putting Pokemons in their business, and there are also some criminal elements that are putting Pokemons where it puts people at risk. Does Niantic have any responsibility for that, or is it simply a buyer beware and a caveat emptor? Uh, from my view, it's it's mostly mostly the latter, mostly the user that takes the responsibility on themselves. I mean, this is a, a fixed map in space. There, Niantic is in charge with policing the conditions in those areas. Um, you know, on the other hand, there could be a set of facts where maybe maybe it could be argued that they or another publisher should have known better. I've kind of speculated about these these fact patterns too in, in the book I wrote on the subject, and, and there are other examples of AR games out there where the publisher is more involved in encouraging and almost requiring players to go to specific places in space. And at that point, there, there's a better argument for for saying they have some responsibility for maintaining the safety of that area. Well, gentlemen, we need to take a quick break before we move on to our next segment. We'll hear a message from our sponsor. Clio is an invaluable software solution for law firms of all sizes, handling all the demands of your growing practice from a single cloud-based platform. Clio enhances your firm with features such as matter and document management, time tracking, and even billing. Clio is an effortless tool that helps lawyers focus on what they do best, practice law. Learn more at Clio.com. That's C-L-I-O.com. Welcome back to Lawyer to Lawyer. This is Bob Ambrogi, and uh, joining my co-host Jay Craig Williams and I today to talk about Pokemon Go and the legal issues are Professor Adam Timish, Assistant Professor of Law at the University of Nebraska College of Law, and Brian Wassum from the firm Honigman, Miller, Schwartz, and Cohn. I wanted to ask about the potential government regulation of Pokemon Go play. Uh, I, I've seen a, a couple of articles uh, questioning whether this might happen in the sense that uh, if you have too many Pokemon Go players wandering around a, a public space, a, a park or, or a city uh, city square or something of the sort, uh, they could start to get in the way of people who aren't playing Pokemon Go or become a kind of a nuisance to those people. Are we at all likely that we're going to see uh, government stepping in here and trying to in some way regulate Pokemon Go? And if, if so, do we start to face, I don't know, First Amendment issues around that? Yeah, I guess my thought on that is I want to take a wait and see approach and see how long this lasts. <laughs> um, obviously, <laughs> it, it takes a lot to get a move like that. Um, and it either takes something really big, you know, to get movement in the short term or some significant event or prolonged period. And, you know, I'm not sure. I don't know how long Pokemon Go craze is going to go. I imagine that this type of gaming in general, you know, people will figure out that this is making a lot of money. And so if we see the, the augmented reality type gaming take off, I think then we might start to see more uh, more movement in there. But in the short term, I 
think that we'll probably see, but who knows, some restraint as people just try to figure out exactly what's going on and how to craft these. Um, but I, I think you're right that there are normal sort of issues here about regulating public spaces. Uh, here in Nebraska, we had people, you know, jumping the fence of the football field to go in because there were great Pokemon there. And so what they did here is they just opened it up. They said, all right, we've got an afternoon for a few hours. Come on out, catch all you can catch. And they handled it that way rather than, you know, trying to come up with some more heavy handed um, legal approach. They have the laws on the books, obviously. Um, And so I imagine that cities and different public places will you know, come up with softer sort of solutions to work with the public unless you really see this, you know, really take off and this is an ongoing issue. How effective are the terms of service and the end user license agreement in this circumstance? Can Niantic really rely on those, which I imagine are largely unread by the general public? Can they rely on those uh, disclosures and waivers? Well, I mean, it's tough to give an opinion one specific fact scenario. I mean, the, their terms and conditions are not unlike the ones that were used for Ingress or uh, any other type of, uh, of game uh, of this nature or any other mobile app for that matter. I mean, you kind of have to go looking for them in, in most instances. In this game, it does pop up when you first log into the game, when you first register for an account, you are forced to look at the screen um, as I recall, I think you have to click the agree button and, and by and large, in, in every case that's considered that issue, if you're forced to, to give some sort of affirmative consent, then it, it's on you what's in those terms and, and you're generally held to them. Yeah, and you know, it always there's always a public policy angle to that. If it's determined that these things uh, get too overbroad, or there's some way that this particular type of clause is being applied in these applications, you could see some pressure on that, um, but I largely agree with that. I, I mean, we generally accept these um, even on these apps where you're just clicking through and downloading. And so, you know, you need to go beyond. There needs to be something extra about this case that will push a judge to look beyond it most likely. What about a very different kind of a legal issue here, which is the privacy of the users who are playing Pokemon Go? My understanding is that this game is uh, accessing quite a bit of the user information on their uh, mobile device, uh, not just the the uh, game, but maps and contact information even, uh, and other personal information. Are you seeing overreaching here on the part of the game's developers, and and do you see legal issues uh, arising out of that? I think one of the nice things we saw with this, actually, you know, they they came out, there was original press about, you know, for certain users, it was accessing your entire Google account, so it could scan all of your emails and everything in your Google Docs, and there was a a bunch of press about that, and what you saw was a real quick response by the company to say, you know what, we don't need that, (laughs) we're going to carve back on it, and so whether you think that's sufficient or not, it is an area where you saw, again, a, a soft solution here. Um, but largely in the U.S., it's a buyer beware type situation. There's not a broad right to privacy in these matters. The applications tell you what permissions they want, and a user accepts it or not before download. And so short of resorting to that sort of public pressure, there's not a heck of a lot uh, a user can do in this situation. Other than not play. <laughs> and they are they are pretty upfront with what they're collecting. I mean, you can open up any of the Pokemon you've collected in the game, and you can see uh, on a map the exact point in in physical space where you captured this Pokemon, the date that you captured it, which lets you know that they're tracking all this information too. You know, they're they're watching you on a map and, and seeing how players use the game, and I'm sure they're adapting the game accordingly. Well, it looks like we've just about reached the end of our program, so it's time to wrap up and get your final thoughts. So, Adam, let's start with you. Yeah, I guess it's just interesting for me, you know, as someone who's thinks about the law and teaches the law how many different areas that an app like this touches. And I think a lot of our first instincts is to kind of go crazy about how this is going to change everything. And when we step back and look at it, oftentimes we find that our existing legal doctrines and existing rules apply perfectly well, right? Trespass is trespass. Um, But it 
it is interesting to see where this pushes, and it's interesting to see if it stays. And if so, I think we might see some new norms develop, and we you know, might see some actual laws develop to the extent that this sticks around and augmented reality starts disrupting more people's lives. Great. And let's get your contact information as well so we can, our listeners can reach out to you if they would like to, Adam. Yeah, um, I am at uh, the University of Nebraska College of Law, so I've got a profile there at law.unl.edu. I'm on Twitter uh, at Adam Timish, that's A-D-A-M-T-H-I-M-M-E-S-C-H. Great, and Brian? Sure, so I'm a lawyer who's been thinking about augmented reality law issues and blogging on them for the past six years now. So Pokemon Go doesn't, so much excite me for what it is. It's it's a spur of the moment, you know, uh, fad right now that's going to fade uh, sooner or later, I'm sure. But it's exciting to me, and it's exciting to the other people in the AR industry uh, that I work with on a daily basis because it's finally brought AR into the mainstream consciousness. I mean, these issues have been out there for a long time, but we wouldn't be talking about them right now if it wasn't for Pokemon Go. So we're excited for it for that reason. Um, but to me, it's just to the tip of the iceberg on how um, AR is going to affect our daily lives. It's a medium um, just like the Internet is, and it's going to affect uh, daily life, I think, uh, just as extensively as the Internet has to modern society. And uh, the legal issues that come with them are, are, are going to be exciting. Just like Internet law, it, it didn't, like Adam says, it didn't create brand new legal principles, but it, it sure did stretch and reshape and recast some of our, our uh, long-held legal principles in a new context. Great. And your contact information? So uh, you can find me at wassom.com, W-A-S-S-O-M.com. That's where I blog, and I'm available on Twitter at BD Wassom. Great. Thank you very much. Well, that brings us toward the end of our show. Bob? I'd just like to thank our guests. We've been speaking with Professor Adam Timish, Assistant Professor of Law at the University of Nebraska College of Law, and Brian Wassum of the law firm Honigman, Miller, Schwartz, and Cohn. Really, uh, thanks to both of you for your uh, time and for your insights on this topic. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And that brings us to the end of our show. This is Bob Ambrosia on behalf of uh, Legal Talk Network and J. Craig Williams. Thanks for listening. Join us next time for another great legal topic. When you want legal, think lawyer to lawyer. Thanks for listening to Lawyer to Lawyer, produced by the broadcast professionals at Legal Talk Network. Join J. Craig Williams and Robert Ambrosi for their next podcast, covering the latest legal topic. Subscribe to the RSS feed on LegalTalkNetwork.com or in iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer. Consult a lawyer.